Before the state of Utah decriminalized polygamy, we were already paying out literally millions of dollars every single year to support illegitimate polygamist families. Now that the state of Utah has decriminalized polygamy, those costs are expected to become an avalanche increasing annually. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is among the wealthiest churches on earth. With access to your taxes like this, they should soon become the wealthiest. With the COVID virus, forest fires, and hurricanes, is polygamy really where we want to spend our tax dollars? These polygamous families do need help. But the money given to them should be recuperated from the churches, the groups, the businesses who participate in polygamy. There are millions of Americans right now struggling for their property and their lives. The cost of polygamy really should fall on the backs of those who created that problem. I have just written a new book called Born in Polygamy. It will tell you all the dirty little secrets that go on inside of polygamy. It's available now on Amazon. Thank you. Part two of Rebecca Kimball's book revealing the trauma, the oppression, and the abuse in Mormon polygamy groups next on Polygamy, What Love Is This? Rebecca Kimball uh, experienced terribly uh, abuse, abusive trauma and uh, violent treatment before she escaped from the Mormon-based polygamy group that she was born and raised in. She's been interviewed by several different programs and hosted her own videos and YouTube segments and even uh, was interviewed for a long uh, interview on our yeah. DVD, Lifting the Veil of Polygamy. Or, or, no, I think it's the Hagar home. But anyway, Rebecca has recently written her story and published in a book entitled Born in Polygamy, a True Crime Autobiography. She was born and raised under the ruling and powerful dictatorship of patriarchal Mormon polygamy. She tells her story wanting to inform the passive public of this oppression of women and children and to make a difference anywhere she possibly can. Part one, we ended where Rebecca's nine-year-old cousin had been betrothed to a 60-year-old polygamous man. As Rebecca grew older and saw the favoritism evidenced in polygamy and experienced the poverty and hunger, the abuse and depression of the women and children, she had some serious questions. <laughs> The self-righteous egos of men of the priesthood degraded females and others, and she wanted some answers. Like so many, either in the LDS church or polygamy groups, we tend to ask questions of those we trust and who we think should know the answers. Yeah. But we get no answers. <laughs> the same was true with Rebecca, and we quote from page 46. When I was all alone, I would pray and ask God about every question that perplexed and concerned me. As time went by, I was asking God questions I dare not ask any man of the priesthood, not even Uncle Rulon. I asked God why Uncle Rulon, the one and only prophet of God on earth, didn't realize that we were hungry. I asked God what sin we'd committed when we were sent home just after the Sunday meetings were over while everyone else stayed and ate at the large family outdoor picnics. Sometimes I asked Mom too many questions and she would get agitated with me. She told me to obey the priesthood. That was all I had to do and all I had to know. After several of those responses from mom, I realized that she was afraid. Mom was afraid to question anyone about anything, especially the men of the priesthood. I learned to quit voicing my questions, but I never quit 
contemplating and seeking answers. I tried to balance what I had been taught against what I had witnessed. I often found controversy between the actions and the words and the religious teachings of some adults. That included some very important priesthood men. The more I saw, the more I knew my silent questions had only begun. So she was very observant, wasn't yeah, she? Tried to, I'm sure a lot of people pay attention to at least some of these contradictions. I and, hope so. Yeah. Uh, Mormonism's model from the beginning always seemed to obey without question, whether it's sure. the mainline church or the polygamy groups. Chapter 8 is entitled, Groomed for Marriage. And now this topic and behavior of polygamy groups is probably one of the most important yet disgusting, perhaps it even tops the list of all of their repulsive practices and it may, may be the, my, my, the most mind controlling of them all. Yeah. She talks about child brides. More often than not, marriages were arranged with child brides because it would give the husband the opportunity to finish raising her so that she would learn submission as her place as a wife in God's work. We quote from page 47. Boy. Young brides were placed in marriage through holy revelations from God. They were told by God himself who was worthy to receive a young bride and which family she would be chosen from. They would decide which new convert, new business partner, or priesthood member she would be given to. Child brides were preferable not only because of their age, but because they were easier to keep from trying to escape polygamy because they had been indoctrinated into it from birth. They had grown up knowing their salvation depended on living plural marriage. Females indoctrinated into plural marriage from birth are a lot easier to control in polygamous marriages. They are more willing to give their own young daughters in polygamous marriages because they have never known anything else. You can see the brainwashing is yeah. so important in it something like this. It generational too. Huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. There is so much information in this book, we obviously cannot cover it all, nor do we want to. This is only a review. You'll need to read the book for yourself to learn all that Rebecca experienced. Those in polygamous communities who claim there are no abuses or oppression or forced marriages are lying. <laughs> it might be more subtle in today in some of the groups and in some cases than it was several years ago, but it's still there. And lying for the Lord, make no mistake, Lying for the Lord is the great privilege with which they often bless themselves. And they brainwash they us with that, that too. Yeah. Rebecca writes about two new convert, converts into the All Red group. And Rulin All Red wanted to keep them happy so he could enjoy their loyalty and their tithing. They were both from Germany. Mm -hmm, so to keep their loyalty, he made arrangements for them to have a child bride. We quote... From page 48, he confidently informed them that his eight-year-old niece, Becky, who happens to be Rebecca, and my 10-year-old sister, Rennie, were ready to start being groomed for marriage. These noble men needed to get to know the young girls and make them comfortable in their presence. We were to become the child brides Uncle Rulin had chosen just for them. He claimed that both of these marriage arrangements had been revealed to him, and it was God's will. Okay. Of course. Oslaf was the, na the, the man that was chosen to marry her 10-year-old sister, Rennie, and he had a 10-year-old daughter who was Rennie's age. In fact, he bought bicycles for the two girls so that, they, so that his bride-to-be and his daughter could play together. Oh, boy. But when he started making advances on Rennie and getting mighty friendly with her, she complained she didn't want to go over to his house anymore, ever again. Suddenly she was no longer welcome and was forbidden to play with his daughter. Uh -huh. And a couple of days later, her bicycle disappeared. <laughs> nice people. Hans was the name of the man chosen to, for Rebecca to marry. He was stocky and plump and was quick to announce that he was full German and the member of the white superior race on his way to becoming one of God's chosen people on earth. We quote from page 49. He took me into his house where he asked his wife to assist him in making me less tense. She stared at him with a cold, hard look and continued cleaning up the ki her kitchen. When I returned home, I begged mother not to send me back Mom would not listen to my pleading. 
She was afraid, she was afraid to disobey Uncle Rulon, the prophet of God. She was even more afraid of what, of what Dad would do when he discovered Rulon was trying to take control of his family. So mm -hmm. again, we have these politics going yeah, on behind the scenes. For sure. Her father soon did discover uh, that Uncle Rulon was arranging marriages for his daughters. All of a sudden, he realized that Rennie and Rebecca were valuable commodities in the world of polygamy, and he immediately took control of the marriage arrangements for the two girls so that he, not Rulon, would gain through their marriages. So Rebecca's father sent for her to evaluate her as a child bride. She was scared to death. We quote from page 50. Mom tried to calm me as she bathed me and dressed me to look like a woman. She dressed me in a woman's sized dress that was far too big. She found a bra and put it on me. I had nothing to put into that bra, so Mom stuffed it until it was full. She tried her best to make me look like a grown-up woman. I could see the disappointment in her eyes when she finished dressing me. There really wasn't anything she could do to make me look like a woman. I was obviously just an eight-year-old kid. I was scared. I did not want to go to my dad's house. I did not want to leave my mom. Mom had tears in her eyes. She said if I got married, I might get enough food to eat and I'd never be hungry again. Somehow that didn't even begin to soothe my feelings. Hunger was not as hard to face as daddy was. Oh, I she can't was imagine. Eight years old. Yeah. Well, Rebecca failed the test that night. Her father sent her back home to her mother, angry and disappointed. He told her mother to teach her how to obey him as though he was God himself. He blamed her mother because Rebecca was not ready to accept her place as a plural bride among God's chosen people. At eight years old, Rebecca writes she had failed her first test of womanhood. Absolute depravity. Yeah. It has to be absolute depravity. Mm -hmm. After her father had finished venting his anger on her mother, he left. Rebecca said that after he was gone, she began to see a sign of relief on her mother's face and then a slow, sweet smile. <laughs> Rebecca remembers that, she, that her mother walked over to her and put her arms around her and held her close and said, Thank God you're home. Too bad it didn't end there, and we could say that they all lived happily ever after. Boy. But that's not the way it works in life, and Sad. for sure doesn't work like that in polygamy groups. Rebecca's mother was his least favorite wife, oh. okay. which resulted in abusive treatment of her and her children by her father and his other wives. And I kind of wonder why she was, because she was the leader's daughter. Or, oh yeah, uh, and sister. Yeah, or yeah. her sister. Yeah. yeah, she was, she was the leader's sister. Right. So why didn't he treat her wow. a little better? I don't, I don't understand. She didn't explain it. But both her, her mother and the children were afraid of, of Rulon and of course of of her father. And when the opportunity arose, uh, she was ready to escape. The mother escaped with the children. Wow. And the father, and, and obviously Rulon for a while, didn't know where they had gone. And after much hardship and poverty and even hunger, they were able to get a homestead place in Juab, Juab County in Utah. And living at the little homestead, she said, was the first healthy and happy and well-fed times they had ever spent together as a family. Mm -hmm. The children were able to go to public school rather than the school that was owned and run by the polygamy group. And this was the first time that she had been allowed to look at books and writings that had not been printed by the polygamy group. Mm -hmm. Her mother encouraged her to learn how to read and to read better so that she could read the gospel <laughs> all by herself. And of course, that would be the polygamous gospel. Yeah. We quote about what she learned from reading it all by herself. Mm, page 68. <laughs> As the time passed, I read my way through so many gospel books that I discovered they often contradicted each other. I found that asking too many questions angered adults, so I quit asking questions and continued to seek answers by reading more, which was thought-provoking, I was aware I was breaking a basic fundamentalist polygamous commandment, which is, thou shalt not think. <laughs> Blind obedience is essential for God's chosen people. This brought me to a second sin. I was thinking and seeking logic instead of blind obedience. I dared not tell a soul. They made a mistake teaching me to read better. 
That mistake was the first step on my way to freedom. Okay. So a lot of this sounds Mormonish too, doesn't it? it? You really know, does. It, you listen to don't what we think. teach you and yeah. Yeah, don't think don't beyond think. what we've well, told we you already. You. Yeah, that's right. And that's what they do, the same thing. It is a brainwashing technique yeah. and mind control technique sure in, in both, and all of Mormonism. That's, yeah. that's what they have to do because if you start to think, you're going to end up yeah. like uh, people yeah. who leave and... And don't, because they discovered the truth. And don't trust the Bible. You can't trust the Bible. And mm -hmm. so don't spend any time in that and just uh, mm -hmm. be blindly obedient. Yep. Yeah. Now, it's important to relate how the author herself was given into marriage. And so we're going to cover that part of her story now. But put on your seatbelt because this is tough. In actuality, Rebecca was purchased with cold hard cash. Rulin Allred, who was considered the mouthpiece of God, all the prophets of the polygamy groups are the mouthpiece of sure. God. The Rulin one, Jeffs. The one and only. The one and only God. mouthpiece of God, right. Yeah. And Warren Jeffs also claimed that. He put that in a lot of his sermons, that he was the mouthpiece of God. And, and the living, and that they, they were the living prophet. They were the priesthood holder and, yeah. and the one to be obeyed without question. And he told Rebecca's mother, that she needed to get married again, and he even chose who she would marry. Well, Howie was the name of the man she was told to marry, but he had an eye for, his, for her daughters. And in fact, as it turned out, he brutally raped Rebecca when she was 11 years old. We quote from page 99. Howie grabbed me by the hair, pulling a handful of hair out as he dragged me across the room. I knew in my heart and soul what his intentions were, I fought desperately to escape, knowing that if I survived Howie's brutal attack, I, I would be blood atoned for losing my virginity. Because I was screaming for help, Howie violently slugged me in the mouth and threatened more blows if I didn't stop screaming. I screamed even louder. The second blow to my mouth caused permanent nerve damage. I wouldn't stop fighting. He slugged me in the left eyebrow so hard it left a deep cut and a permanent scar. Howie produced a pocket knife and repeatedly cut me. He threatened to plunge the knife deeper into my body if I didn't stop fighting. He cut my cheek, my legs, my hands as I fought for my life. I never stopped fighting. I was still fighting when he tied me to the bed. He suspended my body by my right arm and my left leg to the old iron bed and violently raped me. Howie's weight on my small suspended body was too much for an 11 year old to bear, and he quickly dislocated my hip. Now this is, again, it's, crazy. it's, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible. And, and when I read things like this, and there's so much sex abuse in polygamy groups, how can they do things like this and then stand up and say, we're God's people? In the name of God. And, yeah, yeah it's, we're God's people. Yeah. And the leader will often know that these things happen and let it go and stand up in front of their church meetings and say, we're God's people. His special, cream of the crop, special love people. I, mm, it's, it's later, <laughs> it is, it is, it, 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 it brings emotions up in me when I read things like this that oh, of is, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to deal with sometimes. Uh, she writes that later, when her mother found her, she was still tied to the bed. It was a bloody mess and severely traumatized. And to throw salt onto this wound or wounds, this rapist demanded that he take Rebecca as a plural wife. Hmm. Because, <clears throat> according to Mormon polygamy doctrine, she had lost her virginity, so now she was impure, and so was other otherwise would be damned. There was no other choices for her. Rebecca writes that for the next two days, her mother, who was horrified about what had happened, and she knew what the choices were, she read and reread the blood covenant doctrines in the fourth volume of the Mormon Journal of Discourses. And in the meantime, Rebecca remained captive, still tied up by those ropes, awaiting the sacrificial death of her non-virgin soul. During that time, she prayed and her mother prayed. And during her prayer times, Rebecca discovered something earth shaking about their doctrine and about God. We quote from page 100. This is so wonderful. I mean, 
God's so gracious. He is. I silently prayed to God, not asking him for life, but for wisdom. I asked God why. Why would a just God <clears throat> require my execution for a crime committed on me and against me? Why? Why? Then suddenly I knew no, no just God would. I knew the God of my people was not God. My body remained captive, but my mind was free. They could take my life, but they would never have power over my mind again. My fear of death was gone. So That's there, beautiful. yeah, it is. It's wonderful. God, God showed himself who she, he was, who he wasn't. One of the things that I yeah. specifically uh, am so grateful for when I found the, uh, the true God, um, and I thanked God for who he was and also for who he wasn't, yeah. because he wasn't the God that Rebecca was raised with, or the God I was raised with. The punishing. Yeah, the uh, awful, awful, fearful. God. Mm -hmm. And yeah. would not have the fear, create the fear that she had. And right. No and, just and, God. And, would. And, and, and in First John, it says, God is love, and there is no fear in love. There's no fear in love, and God is love. So why would you live in this fear that these polygamy groups, and even the Mormon church, uh, cause, our, cause their people to have? because that, that's not God. That's neat that she would ask for wisdom and be given that yeah. little gift. Yeah. Well, it would be through much more pain and many years before uh, Rebecca truly was free from the tenacious grip of the Mormon polygamist, physically free, mentally she was. <laughs> Her mother managed to free themselves from the evil grips of this man by hiding her from him and escaping into another part of the state. However, <laughs> later she was forced into a polygamous marriage. They had been away from her real father for several years, but they accidentally met him while they were in Salt Lake City. Boy. Uh, he gave her mother some orders that Rebecca didn't hear, but he was intent upon assuming or reassuming control over his wife and children, <coughs> and he made plans for Rebecca's marriage. We quote. From page 114. Not long after that, he announced that he had made a cash deal to give me away as a child bride. Dad obviously did not care to speak with me about that. Somehow in my father's mind, giving me to a stranger in marriage was none of my business. He contacted one of his polygamous prison buddies, Fred Cleveland, who had a son named Bert, and Bert was looking for a child bride. Predators. Uh, Cash Bert, deal. Yeah. Bert's polygamous father had told him that he could get a child bride, and like a parent, then he could teach her and uh, to be the kind of a wife that he wanted. He told her, he, he told him that there's no limit to the number of wives he can have for a price. Before Bert agreed to pay the money for his child bride, Rebecca, he said he had to see her for himself. He met her, spoke very briefly to her, and reported back that he was anxious to go through the deal, <laughs> exchanging his money for Rebecca. Not too long after that, Bert came to the house, and she said that he had laid money out on the table and bought her like a calf at an auction. She says she never knew how much she had been sold for. <laughs> We quote. I never did know how much it was. I had seen Bert briefly for the first time a few days earlier. Bert was extremely thin and stood several inches above me. Even so, he was plenty big enough to intimidate me. After Bert handed the money to Mom, he informed her that Dad was coming by to collect the money within the hour. Moments later, Bert took my arm and guided me toward his car. My duty as Bert's wife would begin that very day after the priesthood had performed the wedding ceremony. There was no way for me to escape. I was taken to stand before Rulin Jeffs, who informed me that I had my free agency. He said I could choose not to live polygamy, but if I made that choice, I must accept the fact that by rejecting God's holy covenants, the only way that I could redeem myself from losing my eternal salvation was to have my blood shed. I would have to forfeit my life for the sin of rejecting God's commandments. So there's your, the free agency there's in the polygamy. Free agency. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, they claim they give them free agency. This is it. Yeah. And that's what freedom of choice is. Absolutely. 
Uh, now, Rebecca, we had talked about birth certificates before, yeah. and Rebecca says that since her birth certificate had been falsified about who her father was, she's not sure how accurate the, all of the information was on the birth certificate. Uh, but when she was married, according to the birth certificate, she was just barely turned 15 years old. And look at all she'd been through already. Already. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, already. Mm. It's just... It's, it's, it's just hard to understand. <laughs> oh, and there must be many, many stories in here that uh, we haven't touched on, huh? <laughs> there's, there's many, many, many stories in here like that, and and you know you just have to read the book. We no, we can't do it all no. on the show. Of course, we don't even want to because she needs. Rebecca wants people to get the book and read it. But think of the the decades since Joseph Smith in, inaugurated polygamy and the many, many thousands and thousands and thousands of people who have lived it. How many times have these, these stories, stories repeated. been repeated? Oh, yeah. And never told. Never told. Just quiet submission and fear. And the outside world has no idea what's going on. Um, they believe that it's freedom of religion, but the, U the, the United States Supreme Court already ruled that freedom of religion does not, uh, does not include freedom to break the law. No. And that's what they're doing is breaking yeah. the law. So, you know, like we said, there's so much more to her story. We barely scratched the surface. Uh, read it and weep. I did. Huh. I did. I bit. Yeah. It reminded me too much of my own brainwashing and the violence and abuses I and countless others have experienced and witnessed growing up in polygamy. Uh, like we've said too, each group has the same Mormon polygamous doctrine. Maybe a little bit different in the way we the, that they work things through, but it's Basically, the same doctrine. All from the same same fruit, <laughs> the same, same fruit. tree. <laughs> same, yeah, the same tree. And it's painful. It was to Rebecca. We've just, like we say, just read some of the things that she tells about what happened to her. It was painful to her, it was painful to me, painful to others that we've talked about in the book, and it continues to be for thousands of young women whose silent screams, like you said, will never be heard. Hmm. They just won't be heard. And yet... The... I had no idea. I, you just don't... Uh, in the mainstream church, I, we're just not aware. I guess unless you went and picked up a book like this, which you normally wouldn't do. We're yeah. proud of our polygamy heritage. Yeah. I've said that before. I was from a polygamist uh, who came with Brigham Young, and yeah. I was proud of that, but uh, never even th for a second thought about the pain and the right. jealousy and all the deprivation and everything they went through. Well, was one of the, the lies way. or one of the false ideas about early Mormon polygamy, which you probably believed, was that they had peaceful homes and oh. they got along with each other and loved each other and and everything was just hunky-dory in the polygamist homes. Yeah, for the 10 seconds I thought about it, that's <laughs> probably what I thought. But I spent no time even really thinking. Uh, 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 the, you should. I mean, if you're, you're going to have those kinds of conflicts and problems. Yeah, and yeah. I didn't realize the men uh, were only married to the, really married to the first one. To the, that oh, was the legal oh, wife. Oh, I didn't, didn't know, know that. that. You thought they were legally married to all of them? Yeah, I didn't know that. I, I do. Be, I always believe that they lied for the Lord, so to speak. They yeah. wouldn't say that they were polygamous or taught. But I didn't know the children from the second and third wives were not permitted to carry his name. Oh, some groups do. Some do groups do, but a lot they, of them don't. Of them we don't. didn't. So, so, so much I group. didn't know. And there's so much a lot of people don't, don't know. So about it. that's why we have our show, is yeah, to, to inform right. and, and to let you know what's going on. Yeah. Um, and read books like this so that you can really get a good grip. Thanks, Earl. I really yeah. do appreciate uh, doing this with you. It's, it's a privilege. Uh, yeah, me too. You know, John, the beloved disciple of Jesus Christ, writes that Jesus is the word of life and that he was truth incarnate. When it comes to truth, new is not better. Jesus, who was from the beginning, is not better, but best. Nothing, no one, no teaching, no modern prophet, no further revelation is needed beyond the best because you can't get better than the best. And the best is Jesus. 
we don't stand upon the shoulders of Jesus with new truths or new and progressive revelation. The best has already come, and he has revealed to us everything we need for us to have eternal life with him. And you will find no place where the word of life ever taught that polygamy was God's pleasure or his requirement. It's only Jesus. Thank you for watching.